Acts 9 and 10. Well, at this point in the story, it's vital to understand a way of thinking that's going on really since the beginning of the New Testament and still now at the beginning of the book of Acts. And that is this, that, well, let's begin at the end. What's called the inheritance of the Holy Ones in Colossians 1 and Ephesians 1 is the idea of a resurrection, that a person will be brought back to life physically into the new kingdom, the eternal life idea of the New Testament. But who would be given the privilege of resurrection? Here's how, again, we have to think going into the book of Acts. It's really what, again, drives the story of Acts more than any other question. A righteous Gentile, think of this as a, a, a non-Jew, if this person was loyal to Yahweh, they believed, or the idea was, that they were righteous. Righteousness came through uh, loyalty to Yahweh. However, when it came to the question of resurrection, that was a privilege of the Jew. So this would be a Gentile, this would be a Jew. Notice both of them are loyal to Yahweh. They are similar in that they're both what we'll call saved. That language could be used of both. But this is very different, again, from how we think today in our normal look at the Bible. The difference of family makes this a question of who is going to actually be resurrected. You could be saved physically during the day of judgment, as it were. God will not condemn the righteous Gentile. But when it comes to who inherits resurrection, that is a family matter. That's the inheritance of the family of Abraham. So instead of who is saved, the question that is driving the book of Acts is, what family are you in? How do you, or have you as a Gentile become a Jew? Because as soon as you become a Jew, now you have the privilege of resurrection. Uh, I was told this over lunch by a Jewess, a, a, uh, a, a woman Jew, who uh, believes in Jesus, and we had talked, and uh, so once I had coffee with her to just get clarification on this, I, I, I asked her, are you saying that uh, I'm righteous because I'm a Gentile who believes in Yahweh or is loyal to Yahweh? And she said, absolutely, I, I consider you a righteous Gentile. I asked her directly, will I be resurrected? And she shook her head saying, no, that is for the family. And again, that matches exactly how Paul describes resurrection. It's the inheritance of the holy ones. Holy ones are Jews because they have access to the temple and access to the ritualistic system that God instituted. So that understanding is so important as we go in now to the stories of Acts 9 and 10. We're introduced to three people. One is Cornelius. Now he would be a, a quintessential Gentile who is a believer. Listen to how he's described in Acts uh, 10, 2 and verse 22. Well, just 10, 2 for now. He is a righteous or he's a devout man, one who feared the Theos, feared God. Um, of course, that's Yahweh. With all his household who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to the Theos always. That, that is a, describing Cornelius. But then we meet two other people. You know them. One is Saul. And let's speak now of these two men's situation in, well, uh, Saul and coming up will be Peter. Acts 9 and 10 really tell the dual stories of Saul and Peter. Of course, Saul is on his way to persecute fellow uh, uh, Jews because of their belief in Jesus. So Saul is not persecuting him, the, the Gentile, a Cornelius figure. He is persecuting a fellow Jew because he's, he is thinking improperly about Jesus. Again, Jesus starts our story where he ended chapter 7, next to Yahweh. Well, anyway, Saul has a, has a vision of Jesus. Two things are mentioned in his story, and as you compare the stories of uh, Acts 9, 22, and 26, the three tellings of, of Saul's uh, calling on the Damascus Road, you learn that he is called to the Gentiles. Uh, that is mentioned in all three stories. I am calling, I, I have chosen you, Jesus says to Saul, to go to the Gentiles and even to suffer um, for what he's going to be saying. But notice what he is told specifically. This is coming out of the story in Acts 26, 18. This is what Jesus tells Saul about his ministry, to open their eyes, the Gentiles, 
in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan. Remember, Gentiles are characterized in the biblical story by worshiping other gods. So Saul's ministry will be to turn people from here to here through, of course, the ministry of Jesus, but turning them from the power of Satan to the power of God. Um, and here's then where it gets very important, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Now, remember how this works in our understanding of what forgiveness meant in that world. It was forgiveness of sins meant they would be admitted to the family which was considered clean, to be forgiven of ritual impurity. In other words, Saul's ministry will be all about taking down this wall, not about who's saved, but about who is in the family. Um, well, then, of course, Saul returns to Jerusalem, and with a little bit of hardship, he joins the Christian Jews in, um, in, in, in Jerusalem. But now that story is about to begin. Now, Peter, on the other hand, has also, uh, he's, he's, he's the main character in chapter 10. Like Saul, these are both really in the same position at the start of our story. He's a faithful Jew committed to the family. He, now, he's not killing other Jews. He is uh, really the heroic figure of the Jerusalem church at this point. He's healing and even raising the dead. But he also has a vision, just like Saul does. And again, he meets Jesus, apparently, in this vision. And Jesus tells him this line, What God has cleansed, you shall not call common. Do you notice how that's really this idea repeated? What God has cleansed, the idea is, and of course the story will now go in the direction of Cornelius as he meets Cornelius. In other words, Saul and Peter have two visions and they have the same point. That Peter is told what God has cleansed you shall not call common and then he sends him to our, uh, our heroic uh, Gentile of this story, Cornelius. Um, so in a word, Saul and Peter are told the same thing. What we want to see going forward, according to Jesus now, and, and he was all about this in his ministry, I want you to preach a gospel where my lordship over the cosmos is equally given or available to anyone, whether Gentile or Jew, so that if anyone uh, believes in Yahweh, I have cleansed them, forgiven them of ritual impurity, and they can be part of the same family, so that they all now, everyone, can, in, can, can enjoy the inheritance of the Holy Ones. That is resurrection. So Saul will understand this immediately. Peter will have a bit of uh, a rough go. He'll say this in 1028 to Cornelius. You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation. That's because they're not family. They're unclean. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Um, and, of course, that's good in words, what Peter will now go through, and we'll see this in the book of Galatians and also in the book or in the chapter of uh, uh, Acts chapter 15. Peter's going to have a little harder time getting that through his, his mind, that he can physically even be seen with Gentiles, but we'll see how that story goes. Mm -hmm.